you're not treating other students as full-fledged human beings when you hold back what you feel and think. And I try to just make the argument, a humanistic argument, respect for the other is sharing how you see the world without seeming, and especially with white students, somehow I'm tainted and don't have a right to say, here's how I see it. So welcome, John McWhorter. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Glenn? I am fine. I am Glenn Lowry. This is The Glenn Show. Uh, the Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City, where I'm John Paulson, Senior Fellow. I'm also a professor at Brown University. Additional support for this episode of the ongoing conversation with John McWhorter that I have is provided by the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. And we are joined today by Jonathan Reeder. John Reeder is a professor of sociology at Columbia Barnard College. Uh, do you all say Barnard College and then Columbia University? or It depends how status nervous folks are. <laughs> oh, <Barnard. laughs> I'm also at Columbia. Barnard's fine. Barnard's fine. <laughs> who teaches courses about race and culture, amongst other things, at Columbia, who's an expert on the writings of Martin Luther King Jr., the author of many books, an urban sociologist, uh, and uh, is uh, here to uh, talk about his experience teaching a course on race and culture uh, at Barnard. And uh, John, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Very much glad to be here. Okay, so you are you have been martyred, have you? <laughs> well, you know, you're putting me in an uncomfortable position. I don't <laughs> like it when the right is like victim, <laughs> bleeding, like, woe is me, but kind of. <laughs> so <laughs> I did, you know, my course was canceled, uh, Culture in America, um, after a brouhaha of over an inadvertent quoting of the word nigga, I was, which led to, headlines in the Columbia Spectator and the New York Post and Title IX racial harassment charges. And John, John, I have to interrupt you briefly. Yeah. Glenn, you realize that the word he just used quite, <laughs> quite unjustifiably is going to be considered the most interesting thing about this entire goddamn conversation. <laughs> what, what is our policy on that here? Because, you know, we're going to hear about that. Yeah. And you know oh, how I feel about oh, it. But. Okay, you're asking me to pronounce a policy. I'll pronounce one. I think you'll agree with it. Within context and without any uh, invi in, in, uh, invidious uh, intent, I mean, if the word is appropriate to the uh, communication that is trying to be engaged in, and it was in that case, because the word had quotation marks around it when he spoke it. He was referring to the word. He wasn't using the word. If, if and you I see what I mean. That, and I stand it, by it that. Can't be, it can't be that he cannot refer to a word because he's white. And That's I heartily nuts. agree. That's no, nuts. it's it's insane, and we are not going to pretend that that isn't true. So I just want it to be clear, given Thank you. the response. <laughs> so continue, John. <laughs> so the but but there are a couple of things about it, and we can go whatever direction you want first. But there's the language part and the policing of language and the correct way of speaking, because that led then to a series of charges of another aspect of diversity language, diversity talk, that the students had been harmed by hearing that language. There's the language of injury. But the second aspect of it, and this really gets into the other Johns, J-O-H-N's woke racism book, it turned out that the word was was not the only thing on P on these three students' minds but the way I dealt with race and class and the way I dealt with white privilege and all of these other things, the language was related to a whole broader worldview about race and diversity. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that then? I mean, what, what are the stakes when a grizzled old white guy like you, excuse me, uh, but who has deep insight into the uh, kind of socio-cultural matrix that you're trying to get students, uh, it, you know, to be aware of, uh, runs afoul of the sensibility of the 19-year-olds who are, are, you know, ha have feelings <laughs> uh, about the way that you deal with, uh, with these issues. And the 19-year-olds are supported by people much older than them who are 
set to support them in the way they handle their feelings. But I mean, and not to go on, it's a university and uh, the, the imperatives are pedagogical and, and uh, you know, epistemological. They're, they're not, uh, uh, they're, they're not, uh, uh, it's not a counseling session. You, you know, they're not therapeutic. The, the, the enterprise is not therapeutic, you know. It shouldn't be therapeutic. But if you look at the Barnard Center for Engaged Pedagogy, and there are a number of people who work there who I respect, they're nice, earnest folks, but it's dominated by a point of view of critical race theory. So there are sessions on racial trauma and you have being comfortable in the classroom and um, the students um, immediately, after I said the word, well, okay, let me make some qualifications like a good social scientist. So there was, after I qu made the quote, a student, the first student who spoke was an African-American who said, yes, I get it. M&M &M gets to redefine the identity that matters as those who've struggled. Because he turns on another black interlocutor and says his name is Clarence. His parents have a real good marriage and he went to a private school. He wins over the African-American audience. And oh, this was in eight miles. In eight yeah. miles. So that's the scene I'm quoting to make the point about the fluidity of identities and how you can start with a default identity that you're black or you're white and then discover the humanity. So the first African-American had no trouble. The second person was an Afro-Latina who said, that's how it was in my Washington Heights high school. There were three whites left in the school and we thought they were from Mars. And we got to know them and realized they were like us. And the third student said, Professor, that's racist. And so I said, you know, I won't, you know, to the person, I really admire you challenging me. That is what free speech and academic liberal arts education should be about. And anybody who wants to continue the talk, come meet with me. And so three students stayed afterwards. And I said, I can continue this as long as you want. And I, I care about this so much. They went immediately to the chair of my department and then various diversity deans and the president. And this goes back to John's point. They were green lit, to put this in organizational terms. It was the adult appeasers or enablers of a liberalism. I call it the choreography of collusion <laughs> the chair said, you have a right to feel safe in the classroom. You should go to the provost and go. So you've got three students in a lecture class of 40 who have got this illiberal sentiment, or maybe one felt actually wounded. I don't think the other two did. But that couldn't have gotten through the gauntlet of organizational life if someone had sat down, the adults, and said, I understand these are difficult issues. I know a Professor Ryder, he's cared about race and racism his whole life. You should go talk to him. Continue the guy. And so I said later to the chair, did you ever think to tell the students, why don't you come talk to Ryder? She said, I wouldn't do that. I told them to go to the grievance people because they have a right to feel safe. I think I might have mispronounced your name when I introduced you, John. I said reader, and I apologize. You know, my whole life, people have gotten the spelling and the pronunciation of reader, writer, so I'm used to it. But thank you. Yes, writer. But it looks like reader. This definition of safe is always interesting because nobody would have used it that way even, I think, as recently as 15 years ago. And the idea is that you've suffered this kind of trauma. And so there's this evolving definition of trauma. And it's not illogical or immoral or silly in itself to extend the definition of trauma. There are things that one is expected to think of as trauma today that back in the day you were expected to just get over. So for example, date rape. I don't think that it's wrong that we have come to define that as trauma rather than a woman saying, I was out with this guy who was all hands. That's that's progress. But the question is whether it's progress to say that it's trauma 
for the N-word to be referred to by a white man in a classroom. And I think that we're being strong-armed into pretending to think that that makes sense by this cadre of people, where the power that they have is that if you call them on the triviality and theatricality of this, you're called a dirty name in wide open spaces. And if possible, your courses are taken away from you. You might even lose your job. Most people aren't up for that. But this really needs to stop. I mean, safety is one thing. Morality and manners change. But here, I frankly think that you were being bullied by people in the name of a spiky and fragile ideology. And what allowed that to happen to you mostly was spectators cowering in fear. And that is not the way things are supposed to be. So this is, I don't make an analogy between the threat of political correctness and social justice warriors and white supremacists on the right, which, but, but <laughs> there is a par- here's the parallel, the guardrail, we discovered how fragile guardrails of democracy are because we assume civic culture, American exceptionalism leads to right? Progressive historiography will have a democracy. And then it turns out Trump says, oh, (laughs) let's try this. And then it turns out the guardrails of democracy are tissue paper and not concrete. The same is true of the guardrails of liberal arts education, that we see how quickly under this new ideology, colleges and universities concerned with branding, their fear of being told you're not good on diversity issues can lead to the unraveling of important values of free speech. And I think it really hurts what real diversity is. I mean, I have some students who, when they talk about respectability politics as assimilation to white standards, and then you say, well, you know, when I think about Jewish life, Jewish immigrants made the distinction between Prost and Edel refined <laughs> and the coarse low people. In in Brooklyn, you know, you say about Gavone, he's a cafone, but the Sicilian is the guttural. A Gavone is like an animal. They're the mafia people, the rough, we, the Irish, you know, the distinction between lace curtain Irish and shanty Irish. And so when I say, why do you assume that there is not some autonomous, great cultural understanding of sublimeness, rationality, composure. Do you think most African-American working class and middle class and lower class for them are, don't want their kids, you know, to have respectability? Of course, it can become an assimilationist tool. So even when I raise those things, I tend not to take definitive stances. I say, I just want you to question these things. So when we do Motown, and there's a great Mary Wilson quote, she said, I always resented it when they said that we were trying to act white. None of us came from families in Detroit that didn't teach us manners, you know, that what you know why you know that hurts me. So even raising these issues as questions, if you're going to make the argument about any of these things, including language, come back and support it with logic and evidence. And that's that becomes harder and harder to do. And I don't shy away from it, which is why I start the course at the beginning. I don't care if you're a Trumpian, a black nationalist, a libertarian, as long as you use evidence and method and rationality and make your let, point. Let me ask, excuse me for cutting you off, uh, John, but I got it. So uh, evidently, there's a clash in the way that you want to approach as an intellectual and pedagogic project the teaching about race and culture and the way in which, I don't know, say the chairman of your department wants to approach it. I, I don't know that, but I'm, a, I'm presuming that is the case. Yeah. Uh, and I have to assume that John will be back, so we should just continue. Um, and I want to try to understand the nature of that, of that clash. Uh, I mean, what is it that you all disagree about that, you know, because there's a power move going on here, it seems to me. 
Ah. where the anti-discrimination DEI stuff is being appropriated on behalf of a, of a con- contestation that's really intellectual, that, 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 that's really about, you know, sort of how you're approaching and what you think is going on. And uh, I, I, do, you, do you think you understand where you have left, quote, the reservation, close quote, where you have deviated and, and become an iconoclast? What is it that you've done that's outside the box, you know. So let me address you as an, you're the economist, I'm a sociologist, or sociologist, social scientist. Almost everything I teach about, be wary of generalizing about, quote, people of color, or is it race or is it class? Because sometimes they interact in complicated ways, and sometimes it's both plus five other things. And with All of those things are just commonsensical ideas of methodological rigor that would have been taught in any sociology, any economics course 50 years ago, and are still mainly taught in many of those methods course. So the answer is my iconoclasm is a kind of conservatism to like basic evidence and don't be bullied by people who don't want to engage. But your question about power, I think, is quite fascinating. I'll keep it short, which is um, two years before when I went, when I, I had been reported for something else by the same chair, I said to the chair, if you had problems with my pedagogy, you've been my chair for six months, why didn't you knock on my door and say, let's get a drink? I want to talk about some of these issues. She said, I wouldn't do that. I have nothing to talk to you about race. I don't like the way you approach it. But And this answers your earlier question. She has never told me exactly what specifically she doesn't like about my approach. <laughs> and see, this is, the, this is the problem. We have this sense that on these issues, logic is not, is, is not appropriate. But, you know, we can't... Um, I salute you, John, in standing up against that kind of of performative, recreational, self-directed non-reasoning being engaged in by people (laughs) who are old enough and responsible enough to know better. And, you know, this is I'm on thin ice here. You know, we we teach at the same place. And um, but, you know, I, I had to skirt wrong verb. I had to wangle some issues like this in one of my classes last semester. It was the first time I found myself wading into this sort of thing in a major way because of some topics that came up. And I found, as I've always noticed, that very few students think this way of any color. Like your story is so typical. It's really generally maybe one and then there'll be one white student who thinks that way and all the others are just afraid of them. Now, all the others are different in where their heads are than their equivalents would have been 20 years ago. There are things that have changed. There are notions of sensitivity. There are notions of what's appropriate. Things things have changed. I've been doing this long enough to know that there are things that even I would have said in a class in 1998 that I would never say now because sensibilities have changed and I don't think it's a bad thing. I've changed with them. But not that I was saying anything egregious, but still, we change. But in terms of the ones who are partisans of the kind of ideology that this person you're talking about had. It's not the majority. It's this reign of terror. And I found in wangling these classes where these sorts of issues came up that I tried my best to respect the views of the ones who were on that very hard, very CRT infused left. But my idea was they can't take over the class. And my job was to make sure that what we had was a middle of the road discussion where people felt comfortable expressing themselves. It wasn't the easiest thing in the world, yeah. but I came out of it just thinking, I love those two students like, like I like the other 23, but there was no way I was going to let that take over the room. And let me ask you this, unfortunately, Josh, a lot of professors are letting it take over the room. Yes. I want to ask you whether you think you're being black allowed you to do what you effectively did, prevent them from taking over the mm. room, which would not have been not have been possible had you not been black. I'm asking whether you think so. A little, but I think it cancels it out that now all of them also know that I'm considered, you know, in kind of bad odor and they have their opinion as to whether or not that's appropriate. And so, yes, I'm black. I can get away with more. But then on the other hand, they all know that they 
know somebody down the hall in their dorm who thinks I'm a bad black person. And so it kind of balances out, but a little, yes. It's a little easier for me to do it because I'm black myself, but I, but I'm, I'm a bad black person. And so it's different. Yeah. Uh, I want to underscore John's point is, and, and I'm writing, I'm, I'm going to write a book, a short book about this again, which not ah. focusing on my own victimization, Banded Barnard. Um, and you know, <laughs> that's your title, Banded Barnard. Report from the front lines of the <laughs> culture wars. And again, I want it to be reflective, not like, oh, woe is me. But one of the <laughs> chapters, the final chapter is called The Liberal Silent Majority. And it underscores John's point. So my Mexican American Tejano students who've got the Trump loving cousin. They write about this for my class. The half um, West Indian, half uh, Colombian, talking about her uncles in the army who believe in patriotism. They right beneath the surface, even at Columbia, is a world of diversity. And this is where I think John is right also. What's changed in 20 years is the students who are not zealots zealous CRT folks are nervous. And so when I'll say, like to my tough guy, <laughs> African-American from the South, and I'll say, well, that would be a really good point to bring into the class. That why you don't want to defund the police, even though you want to really come down on racist police. And I, you, it's just hard, but I do my best to say, Please, you're not treating other students as full-fledged human beings when you hold back what you feel and think. And I try to just make the argument, a humanistic argument, respect for the other is sharing how you see the world without seeming, and especially with white students, somehow I'm tainted and don't have a right to say, here's how I see it. Okay, but John. It's different these days. I, I want to ask you to respond quickly to something. I'm trying, as I always do here at the Glenn Show, to envision what the other side is thinking. And uh, I, I, with respect, okay, because this is just a hypothetical criticism. It's not my actual sincere criticism of you. Here is how it might go. I've heard this guy twice in this conversation refer to critical race theory, CRT. He wants to be uh, an open-minded liberal, but in fact, uh, he and, and he's not going to take responsibility for, for some of the actual heterodox views that he has that cuts across the, the racial justice campaign. What do you mean by CRT? You say you don't traffic in stereotypes, but you just, uh, you just invoked one. Uh, it, as if there was a category of critical thought, which was somehow on the other side of the line. So, okay, I mean, you might be right. Let me just finish. You might be right. But at least take responsibility for your position. Don't try to have it both ways. That sounded just like one of those comments that people were <laughs> <laughs> I read the comments. <laughs> Wait, is that addressed to J-O-N or J-O-H-N? No, that's J-O-N. That's yeah. J-O-N. So let me just give you... I totally agree with what you say, and I affirm the important insights of critical race theory. My objections are usually methodological, that to argue on such a prioris and generalities, I said, I have learned, I have read Kimberly Crenshaw, I have all that, a whole body of work. If you're going to make those arguments, though, you must tie them down precisely and carefully. I legitimate them. I think they're part of the discussion that are really important. And I try to bring them in. Don't just keep on when we're on Zoom, there would be a lot of counter chat kind of kind of undercutting. Bring that into the conversation, get into the flow. And that's why I told the woman who said, Professor, that's racist. I said, I really salute you. You're doing what you should. So the answer is, Glenn, I believe exactly that. I think it's an utterly legitimate perspective. I don't want it to dominate the general discourse without being grounded in actual data. John, I forgot something, actually. The class you're talking about, was it on Zoom? Were we already in the bad era? Yeah. 
Okay, see, that's part of this. People were not that, in the room. They were not in the same sort, room with one another. Oh that God, that's of, very important. It, that yeah. sort of thing. Oh, part of why things got so bad after 2020 is because all of that stuff is easier when people aren't actually together and you've got those chats on the side. I have been saying Zoom and Slack created an awful lot of this. Yeah, I'm not surprised. That's such an interesting point because there then ended up being a separate private Slack or some group among those who said, oh, somebody had quoted uh, white fragility. And I said, well, you know, and they had asked me to assess. And I said, well, I'm nervous about generalizations about any people without evidence. Are all white people fragile? And is, you know, how, you know, and I'm pushing them. And then what enters the chat from a very formidable critical race theorist guy who is just unbelievable. I argue, tried to get him more and more in the conversation, but he said, believe it, this guy doesn't actually believe in anti-racist education. He's against fighting racism. And as you, if his definition was, of racism ref- is the sacrosanct one. Uh, he was what? referring to you, Josh? He was referring to me because I cast doubt on the rigor of Robin D'Angelo. They think Instead, they've got this I, Kantian definition of the ultimate. They really think so. And as such, they don't realize that White Fragility, I literally, it is literally the worst book I've ever read. <laughs> I would agree. Frankly. Well, and then I said, because I had assigned Cornell Belcher's Black Man in the White House, and Cornell Belcher was Obama's survey guy. And he was a serious he, thinker, yeah. Of, is and, a serious thinker. And he gives various surveys to say we don't want to conflate racism with those whites and blacks who believe in ideological individualism. So just because someone says, you know, I think uh, poor people have to work their way up. They should, you know, do what my grandparents did. They came to this country. And so I'm saying, well, I don't, how do you separate these different kinds of attitudes? You simply reject that view as the same as racism. And so just trying to bring that variation again, breaks, as John just said, what is the catechism in a sense that, uh, and nobody was able to give a good argument. And I said, it's very hard to distinguish because real racists translate their racism into the language of self-help. Oh, they're, you know, they're all animals. They don't work hard like we do. But is there, is that true of everybody? I, I want to give my opinion about something, which is, I think, you are struggling for a really tiny sliver of margin of expanding the range of discourse relative to what really should be the objective, which is that it'd be possible to argue against uh, some of the uh, core principles here. I mean, uh, for example, what about reparations? Suppose you were against it. What about affirmative action? Suppose you think Clarence Thomas is right about it. What about the family? Suppose you want to invoke Daniel Patrick Moynihan. What about the cops? Suppose you actually want to count the bodies and challenge the shibboleths that people traffic in uh, about the so-called root causes. That's completely off the table. You're, you're, you're bargaining with them for, you know, just staying in touch with a little bit of corner of reality. You're not really opening the Overton window and letting in some real contestation of of the of the political debate. So in a way, I, it feels kind of almost sad and tragic to me. Uh, it, it's end days. It has the feeling and the sound of the ending of something because we've already lost the 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 core of the argument uh, for open discourse, for free inquiry, for real Socratic con- contestation and argument. I mean, this violence problem. It, I mean, it's it's horrific. It, it it it's not just a question of failed social policy. It, it's it's a, it's a you know there's something really anyway. I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm I'm preaching now, and I, I I'll stop. I, I'm just saying, gosh, if you can't do what you're trying to do, there's no hope. So 
I'm not, uh, you know, get back to me in two years <laughs> if I'm still teaching. I'm an old grizzled man, as you said. But, uh, <laughs> lovingly. I said it lovingly, John. <laughs> oh, I, I heard it lovingly. and I'm Because afraid. I'm one of those guys, too. <laughs> I got a few years on you. And, you know, and I, I'm owning my grizzledness. I, that's my, my intersectional identity is, okay. uh, as my chairs refer to me as, an older white man with power. So that's my intersectional. I'm all, <laughs> I take that. So, but, you know, I see small victories, but to go back to the violence issue, I have been able to open up the discussion, which one Bronx kid who lived in the Death Towers, uh, projects in the Bronx, reported during COVID, she describes herself, look, I'm a hood rat, and I gotta tell you, I can't go out in the streets and get food anymore. Something yes. is happening out there. And she knew all the drug dealers. She's been yeah. totally entangled. And to get some of that discussion, I've, I've pushed on police killings. I said, look, more whites are killed than blacks, some years more Latinos. Um, how do we think about that? If we're going to, should we frame it as social policy strategically? All lives matter. I know that's off the table. Black lives matter. Both matter. How do you say, yes, there's a distinctive African American experience, but, you know, and again, backstage, some will come to me and say, well, I kind of believe that, you know, and, you know, what's bad management? What's racism? What's psychopaths? What's, so I, your pessimism, I understand about the narrowness of what we were able to achieve. I don't have a good argument to say, I do feel an openness among some uh, to at least try to test those waters. But I don't have a good answer on that, Glenn. I really don't. John McGuire, you got me, anything else? Yeah, go ahead. It chills me to my bones to think that there are people, and a lot of them are black, who are pretending that you should be applying the word violence both to being afraid to go to the supermarket in the Bronx and a <laughs> grizzled white man with power using the N-word in the classroom. Both of those <laughs> things are trauma and violence. Something is deeply, deeply wrong. That's a good note to end on this segment of our conversation. John, thanks for uh, joining us, John uh, Reader. Hey. This was good, John. Uh, really delight to be with you guys. I've been a fan of the show. Um, they, my son is a great follower of you guys. So <laughs> he, he, we were arguing the other day over your trans show. Uh, really great huh? stuff you guys are doing. So you, <laughs> you're making some ripples out there. So, And it's John Ryder, not Reader. <laughs> Forgive me you again. say Reader, I say Ryder. Glenn, I didn't know either. So yeah. <laughs> You say potato, I say tomato. Uh, so, Gentlemen, okay. Thanks a lot, John. Hey, have a good one, John. Bye bye, guys. Take care. Bye. See you later, John. You know, John, John and I often talk about higher education on this podcast. Obviously, that's the universe we both inhabit. And why not? It's a topic that has moved front and center of late at both the state and national level. Free speech on campus, viewpoint diversity on campus, cancel culture on campus. Soaring tuition, affirmative action, race-based admissions, accreditation, the erosion of standards, attacks on the classics, hiring litmus tests, critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You name it, it's in the news. So with all that's going on, and there's a lot going on, to whom can one turn as a trusted resource of all issues related to campus reform, whether you're a student, faculty, trustee, administrator, donor, policymaker, or alumni. One source we want you to know about and strongly recommend as a credible and respected voice on all these issues is the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, or ACTA, whom we're pleased to have supporting this episode. ACTA is on the front lines, promoting academic excellence, academic freedom and accountability at America's colleges and universities. They don't just serve as trusted advisors to college trustees and alumni, they help arm reformers with resources, ideas, recommendations, information, even grassroots alumni support through their Campus Freedom Initiative. They make positive changes happen 
And they approach these issues in a nonpartisan, balanced, informed, highly credible way, which we appreciate. If you care deeply about these issues, as John and I do, you really must know more about the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. Start by looking them up on the web at goacta.org. That's goacta.org. And follow them on Twitter and Facebook. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you were insightful as, as always. Okay, so what we're going to talk about, the affirmative action decision is coming any minute now. Is it really? Uh, that's, you know, all the rumblings at, uh, at the uh, Manhattan Institute, they're preparing for, you know, like automatic, uh, you know, tweeting and posting of but instantaneous But you, you don't mean comments. today. Not, no, no, they don't. but I mean, it's expected any day. Oh, yeah, it's going to be Monday or Tuesday, I think. Yeah, yeah that, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Definitely. Yeah, um, there was an article by Richard Rothstein in The Atlantic that I found really striking. And everybody is going to read what I thought about it because I, I am doing a guest post about it on this um, Substack. And Glenn, this appears on Sunday. It right? appears on Sunday. Today is Saturday, uh, right. the, uh, what is it, the 17th of uh, June, and it's going to appear tomorrow. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. At glennlowry.substack.com. I just want to get that in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I had just, um, Richard Rothstein is a well-intended guy who is absolutely appalled that preferences are about to be banned. I don't think we need to pretend that they're, they're toast. And I'm open to looking stupid saying that now if, if they're not, but they're gone. And um, he thinks that this is a terrible thing. And that those responsible for admissions processes should basically resist. They should revolt, as you know, the Jewish radicals used to say, and resist not taking race into account in the same way as the good people resisted the Dred Scott decision. He actually brings up the Dred Scott decision. And what really bothers him is that if you don't have racial preferences and instead it's socioeconomic, you bring in poor black kids, but not middle-class black kids. The idea that you no longer get a preference if you're black and you didn't grow up disadvantaged for him, that is rank injustice because to be a middle-class black person is to be subject to the forces of what are what's called societal racism as well. And that that therefore means that Middle-class black kids should have preferences. Now, preferences is a very euphemistic word. What he's saying is middle-class black applicants should not be expected to have grades and test scores as high as other children, other applicants. And I contest that. I can understand saying that in 1966 because of what racism was like and because racial preferences are a benevolent and in their way wise experiment. But for somebody to write that in 20 23, the idea that me, a young me, should not be assessed as stringently as Asian and white kids because of the kind of racism that maybe has nibbled at the very margins of my life now and then. And I didn't put this in the piece because it wouldn't have looked good on paper, but I've used this analogy before in, in my losing the race I used it. And I'm going to venture it here. I'm almost done. With you think about what disadvantage is. So you're a middle-class black kid. Yes, I'm thinking about me. I did not suffer anything I would call disadvantage. I knew what racism was in many ways. I've, I've written about it. I still do. But that was not disadvantage. And if anybody doubts that, because the idea is supposed to be that just being black is this hideous burden, including suppose some cop at a mall paid more attention to me than to a white kid. I believe it happened once. Yeah, <laughs> that happens. Would I have rather have been me middle-class black me in the 70s and 80s, or even in 2023, or a person who weighs 400 pounds with acne who is white. And I'm not trying to make up a cartoon character. You're white, but you are extremely large and there's nothing you can do about it. That's a difficult condition. And you have very bad skin. Which would you rather be? Or to put a <laughs> point on it, which would you rather be? Middle-class and black or white and simply having really bad skin, psoriasis, serious bad skin, and there's not much you can do about it. It's at the point where, frankly, you'd rather be the middle-class black kid, whereas 60, 70 years ago, I think a lot of people would have thought, I'll be white with you know acne as long as I don't have to be black. That matters. 
And so Richard Rothstein, and he's a man of a certain <laughs> age, and then some, he's stuck in a way of thinking that no longer applies to the present. I hated his article, despite the fact that he thinks he's out there, you know, paddling for me. And so I wrote a piece about it. I, I have I have a, two comments. One of them is a quick thing that, you know, it's, I think it was Derek Bell Faces at the Bottom of the Well, where I first saw this device that you just employed of the hypothetical where, you know, how much would you pay not to be black? You know, and, and his his point was people would rather be a lot of things than to be black because you were at the bottom of the well. And you're making the point that, that that's not true anymore. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't trade uh, blackness for psoriasis, not not in a heartbeat. Mm -mm. Uh, but the other point I want to make is in defense of uh, Richard uh, Rustin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's what he might be thinking. I'd, I'd like to hear how you react to this. Look. Um, the way they're using test scores and stuff like that, uh, we're not getting enough blacks in the university. And that, the university is the portal to actual leadership. It's where Barack and Michelle Obama and people like them come from. The, the elites, you know, th that's why you have affirmative action at Harvard. Uh, you don't necessarily have affirmative action at a, an intermediate level place. We're talking about the elites. If you go socioeconomic and, you know, you admit blacks, the blacks that you admit are going to be from the low income uh, population and they're going to be different than the blacks from the middle income, but, you know, less sophisticated, other kinds of resources in their home, you know, because their parents are, may not be professionals. They may not have the support. Whatever. They're going to they're going to they're gonna be a different selection on the black population. What we're doing here is trying to create an integrated cadre of leaders for the country. And the ingredients that go into that are both what happens in the school and what happens in the home uh, and the background from which the kids come. We find that there's a complementarity between middle classness for Black kids and, and what we have to offer in terms of opportunities for creating an integrated elite. It'll be very, very different if these black kids who, who end up with the Ivy League degrees are all from housing projects and stuff like that. With due respect, I, I say that with a great deal of respect and understanding and sympathy, but I'm just saying it'd be different. It, 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 won't, it won't be the same network. It, it won't be the same social dynamic. So I'm trying, says uh, Richard Rusting, to preserve a device for integrating American elites that draws on the best uh, the most promising of Africa and America and brings them through the funnel into the, into the uh, front rank. And what you're getting ready to do is change that uh, irrevocably and fundamentally. And I think you should think twice before you, before you do that. Yeah. And I actually, Rothstein hints at that. I, I think that he thinks that these, um, these kids from, quote unquote, the housing projects are not going to be as likely to succeed as middle class black kids. And there, there's definitely an argument there. But I think we have to always remember, and it's about language. And I would say this if I bred aquarium fish for a living. This is not a profound linguistics insight, but it's about language. Does all of that mean, Richard, that middle class black kids should not have to have grades or test scores as high as other people, given especially the major friction that this contributes to with the issue of admitting Asian students these days. We are no longer in an America where essentially in an oversimplified way, everybody is either white or black. That's the way it was in the 60s with all due allowances for the complexity, but still. This is post-immigration act of 1965. There are too many other kinds of people for us to be looking at this as if it were still 1965. And honestly, and I, I may be missing something on this, this idea that if a certain number of Black students aren't admitted to, say, the top 35 universities, the most selective, that there's going to be this major problem with getting Black people into elite pipelines, that all hell would break loose, that there'd be this massive reverse of progress, that if you go to UC San Diego, somehow you're barred from the kinds of connections that somebody who went to Cornell had. I'm not aware of the documentation of that. And I am aware of, for example, the fact that racial preferences were banned at the University of California in the late 90s. And a study has been done as to whether or not that has affected incomes of Black and Latino people, apparently only Latino ones, but not Black ones. So what what what's the issue? I'm I'm not I understand that hypothetical that you're not going to get the Obama kids 
and and that therefore you're not going to be able to work for 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 big banks or whatever it is that we're talking about. But is that really true that you have to go to one of those schools in order to get positions like that, or is it that those schools make it so very much more likely that you must submit? Middle class black kids to lower expectations than others. That's the question. Using that word preferences is a game. Uh, it's very stimulating the speculations that you're engaging in right now. And it's making me think about a very um, surprising, counterintuitive, but potentially beneficial consequence of uh, trimming back on affirmative action. And it reminds me of something that Justice Scalia once said in oral argument on one of those University of Michigan cases way back, where he asked the lawyers for the law school, do you have to be such an elite place? And, you know, you say you want to do a firm, you want to integrate it racial and you also want to be elite. And that forces you to have lower standards for the black kids. But it's, you know, premised on your eliteness. Do you have to be so elite? And what I'm trying to say is. If you can get in the front door of leadership uh, potential avenues of growth without having have an Ivy League degree or a Stanford degree or a UC Berkeley degree, but with having a Kansas University of Kansas degree or University of Missouri degree uh, or something like that. The pressure on the elite places to have racial diversity in order for America to have a diverse leadership would be relaxed. They, 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 the Harvards don't have to be as integrated if it's possible to get in the door by coming from a place that's a, a rank 30th instead of rank number third. And if the number three, one, two, and three places can't generate as many black graduates because they're not permitted to lower their standards on behalf of black applicants, that'll force the next stage of the process to look more broadly than just the Harvard's and the Princeton's of the world to try to find their black candidates, which will undermine the elitism of the structure in a much more fundamental way. You know, you, you don't have to have an Ivy League degree to be able to compete for a, a place in the in the queue. And, and we got there by first noticing we didn't have enough blacks with Ivy League degrees, and therefore we had to start looking beyond. And we discovered you don't have you don't actually need an Ivy League degree in order to be able to develop into a productive person in my organization. So the, the clickishness of the elites, I'm, I'm talking about like the microstructure of how the elites are, are, are put together. Um, it's, so there's something very precious about this whole posture. We're super elite, we're super elite, nobody can come, we're the best, we're inner sanctum, we're the et cetera. And we have these standards, which are the justification for our arrogating to ourselves this this kind of elite thing, and yet we're, we're going to lower the bar down here in order to uh, in order to bring the blacks in, you know, in order to make sure we have the nice salad bowl mix of what it is that we're trying to construct in terms of our eliteness. When it's a big country, and there's a there's a lot of places that you can go to school. You don't have to go to school to just these places. Anyway. I think all of that sounds like an America that I would be happy to live in. We, it would really be a rather healthy development. And in the meantime, you wouldn't have, I don't know why I'm thinking of, of this, but it's, you know, we think in images and we think about real people, Katanji, Brown, Jackson, you would not have the white guy going to school with her, quietly thinking, she's not here for the same reasons that I am. That's what this creates. And maybe that was necessary for about a generation or maybe two. But I think of her as an undergraduate because she would have been when I was at Stanford as a grad student. I knew hers. You know, I, I knew what it was like and I knew what people said and I knew what people thought. And you would see a Katanji. Here's this person who is you know, on the Supreme Court and should be there. But you would see her. And if you were a white guy or a white girl, certain type back then, it would be Ethan or Genevieve. They would look at a Katanji and they'd think, well, she didn't have to have the kind of grades I did. And fuck, the sad thing is they were right. It's true. It's enough. To, it's enough of that. That is not something you do until society is perfect. And, you know, as Mrs. Slocum used to say on Are You Being Served? I am unanimous in that. I must say I've become an ideologue about that. No more looking at Katanji Brown Jackson and thinking that she didn't belong. And no, I'm not thinking about myself. I'm too arrogant about things like that. It didn't bother me. And you I don't know think you Katanji Brown Jackson was thinking about it, but it wasn't right. Enough of that. Genevieve shouldn't be thinking that.
And the only way she won't be thinking that is we, if we no longer have this system of subjecting all Black people to lower expectations. Well, I just want to say for the record, I have elaborated my own thinking along these very same lines in my essay, Affirmative Distraction, which can be found in the City Journal, Manhattan Institute's City Journal. But I, I agree. I mean, uh, the way I'd summarize it very briefly is that there, equity is one thing and equality is another. Equity is the lowering of standards in order to get the black numbers up. Equality is a mutual respect based upon equality or parity of performance. There is such a thing as performance. It does differ among individuals. And if you use lower standards to bring blacks in, you're going to get on average lower performance because the standards are correlated with the performance. So it will inevitably lead to the speculation, you know, did she get that seat next to me based on the same performance as I got my seat and so on? Because as a matter of fact, it'll be true that she didn't. <laughs> and th that's not equality. That that's, you know, and you can't just create equality. You can't just call it into being by fiat. It has to be rooted in the actual behavioral foundation, uh, and especially in elite environments, the rarefied, competitive, you know, specialized, you know, highly intellectually demanding environments. And, and respect is, is also an ephemeral thing. I mean, people will say they respect you. <laughs> But, but but real, genuine, you know, uh, honor and respect, these things have to be earned. They, they can't be created by legislation. <laughs> yeah. And you have the middle class black kids at schools like Harvard always complaining. This is the classic complaint since when I was one of them, that people don't want to work in a group with me. You know, they don't they don't want they don't want me included because they think I got in based on affirmative action. Well, frankly, you really may have. And it's an unideal situation. And a certain kind of person, I think the, the kind who was making life miserable for John Ryder, would say, no, even if there weren't preferences, still people wouldn't want to be in groups with Black people because there's just this idea that Black people are mentally inferior. Yes, that's out there. But actually, I frankly think that after you know five, six or seven years, that would not be the case, especially interacting with the Black people who were there. No, they would still be. They would be chosen. There wouldn't be a sense that they got in under different standards. You do that like you apply chemotherapy. You don't do it forever. So, yeah, I yeah. agree with that. Now, you say Rustin is recommending or uh, at least speculating about uh, Dred Scott defiance like uh, civil disobedience? He urges it. The, you know, the, he he just, urges it. He, yeah, he insists that you know, we keep on taking race into account <laughs> despite the ruling. That's how, oh. that's how he feels about this. In other words, he's an ideologue like me. He thinks of, this is what he thinks of as justice. It's what makes him a good person. But I disagree. We have different ideologies. Well, this reminds what me of this that? piece that you and I discussed. Excuse me uh, for talking over you just the, there. Um, I'm done. Reminds me of this Randall Kennedy piece in the New York Times that we both saw not long ago in which he had a long litany of resistance to efforts to make Blacks more equal going all the way back to the post-Civil War legislative uh, contestations about uh, this or that, inc including uh, opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by this or that conservative uh, party and so on, problems with the Voting Rights Act where the courts have not always affirmed what the progressive thing should be done, and uh, culminating in the pending striking down of affirmative action. We don't know what's going to happen, but it, it does look, as you said, John, that uh, it's likely that there'll be significant cutback. And and uh, Randall Kennedy, our friend Randy, uh, Harvard Law professor, a very distinguished uh, writer about race, a former clerk of Justice Thurgood Marshall, uh, uh, an eminent figure, says uh, that this likely uh, takedown of affirmative action by a conservative Supreme Court is yet another instance uh, of uh, the resistance to efforts to expand uh, the uh, opportunities for African Americans. How do you feel about that argument? You know, Glenn, I I couldn't I have to speak carefully on this. I have huge respect for for Kennedy, but sure, I found it hard to square that arg argument with the ones that he's made before. And, and I've reviewed a whole anthology of his pieces. I've, I've read him now for almost 30 years. It almost felt to me, I don't mind if he hears me saying this, 
it almost felt to me as if a chatbot wrote it rather <laughs> than him. Oh, because wow. I just, the idea that to resist old school racial preferences in 2023 is just an example of not wanting the black man to get ahead. That doesn't sound like him because I find it a rather hasty and a rather unsubtle argument. And always, otherwise, he is so good at engaging detail, thinking about the hypothetical, resisting knee-jerk sentiment, very much so. I've often been surprised that he is not included more often among what are considered black heterodox thinkers. I think part of the reason he isn't is because he's not loud about it. And I don't think that's deliberate. I think that's just the kind of person he is. He's not strident, but he has a lot of quote unquote incorrect views. And you can get them from reading his academic and his pop work. But wow, I was just perplexed. I would have expected that argument from somebody like, um, what's his name? Um, um, Ellie Mistal. I would have expected that from, honestly, maybe Kimberly Crenshaw. Although even, she, I don't think she would have gone that way. It just struck me as a rather simplistic argument. It's not about not wanting black people to get ahead. It's about issues of fairness in a highly multi-ethnic society as the decades have gone by. Now, there might be some people who don't want the N-words to get ahead. Sure, there'll be some. That's the kind of thing that I expect from Kennedy, that he would say, yes, there are some people like that. But to say that that's the dominant feature here, that's what the news is on this, I was just really, I was just perplexed. It, it seemed like it was written by someone else. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't get it. I can't put myself in his head on this one. Well, I'm going to connect two things you said that is perplexing and that um, you're surprised that Kennedy isn't thought of more as a, as a heterodox figure because he you know, has had in the past many heterodox views. And I think the, the answer is that he works hard at virtue signaling. <laughs> the, I mean, I, I, you know, I love Randy. I love Randall Kennedy. Let me just say he's been a friend of mine for 40 years. I met him when I first came to Harvard in the early 1980s, and he was at the law school. And um, he he was writing these iconoclastic essays, like uh, he had one where he said, why should I have my black students over for for uh, a drink? Just the black students. And he, you know, and he kind of basically made the argument, no, you shouldn't. You know, I mean, uh, we, my race problem and ours. That was the title of that piece because it was a take on Norman Podhoritz's My Negro Problem in Ours, which was an early precursor of the neoconservative race critique. And Randy was, it was tongue in cheek. You know, he's messing with the reader a little bit when he called his piece that. And, and he questioned the idea of loyalty just based upon the superficial common trait of having the same race as somebody else and thinking that that was in some sense in conflict with his duties as a professor to be you know, engage with all of his students and, and so on. And that's, you know, that's the least of of his, uh, you know, raising sharp criticism. He was a critic of Derrick Bell. He was a critic of critical race theory early on in the law journals when he was writing at Harvard Law Review and saying, I'm not sure these arguments are really all that culture that these guys are making. And the year was 1989 or something like that. You know, he got in big trouble for that. Yeah. Uh, and and so he's he's a he's a guy, but he is a man of the left. I mean, you know, he hates this court, this current six to and three he, conservative. And he despises court. Thomas. He thinks yeah, we've mentioned that here before, and he declares mm -hmm. Thomas is an especially egregious uh, dis disappointment for him uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court for reasons that we could go into. But Thomas's conservative jurisprudence and being black, but but so. Uh, he has a book called For Discrimination, Rand Randall Kennedy does. And in this book, he says, Kennedy-esque, very honest, I have to admit affirmative action is racial discrimination. I I'm just going to tell you it's racial discrimination. But, and then he tries to argue, it's not discrimination that should be held inconsistent with the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And he goes on to say, it's a prudential question about how much or how little, when and how. And I think we both could agree with that. And the what the position that you and I would take that you articulated so well earlier on is, 
man, this is we're 50 years into this darn thing. I mean, really, it's 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 aging not all that well, and it's not the way you want to go out. It, it's it's not the way you want to kind of institutionalize it and make it common everyday practice. Let's not do that to our country. Let's not do that to black people, et cetera. This this kind of thing. So I, I'll say all that. I think that piece, I'm saying all of this good thing, stuff about Randy, say, I think it's a pose. I, I, I think, you know, I don't know Ellie Nistel. <laughs> I, I've seen the name. I've seen the byline. I, I've, I know the type of thing that you're referring to. You can imagine. And, yeah. And he's much better than that. He's much more subtle and interesting of a mind than that. So uh, the idea that the sky is falling, it's Jim Crow 2.0. They're trying to roll back the clock on us. That was the tone of this piece. Here they come again for black people's rights. Come on, man. As Joe Biden would say, come on. <laughs> Ain't nobody coming for black people with hoods on when they say you can't have a standard deviation difference in the test scores of the Asian and the black kids that you're admitting at the margin to an elite university and think that you're uh, consistent with the law of the country. Affirmative action was a state of exception. We stepped away from the framework of colorblind, non-racial treatment in order to deal with a historical contingency. We're 50 years on now. It's time to grow up. You really think it's a pose? You yeah, think that, that, that you're, well, you're I'm not saying he's dishonest. He's persuaded himself of it because his his way of being in the world is to project a certain kind of persona and a certain kind of aura of pro of, of progressive uh, left uh, uh, stance on, on these issues. And because the, the pendulum is swinging, you said it yourself just a minute ago, the country is so dynamic, man. We got more Latinos than we got Blacks. The Asians are coming in numbers and they're a very significant factor, especially within the elite venues. And, and it's not 1970 anymore. It's just not. And you know, both Randy and I are up there in years. I don't know how old he is, but he ain't that much younger than me. So, yeah, it's interesting. He um, yeah, he really came in for it with the CRT, and he has somewhat atoned in in his more recent work. I, I can tell that that really it was it, it was formative for him in the way that it was formative for me to be beaten up about how I felt about using abonics in schools. That's kind of the thing that got me going. That. I think that really that was signature for him. And then also the book, um, watch it, folks. I'm going to say it. The book Nigger. Oh, yeah. That's where a great he got book. in all that trouble um, yeah. because he used that as the title. And that yeah. made a, that, you know, the Julianne Malvo types, they really didn't like that. But and that I was guess, so brilliant and so brave. I mean, you know, we don't just going to run him down here. He's a great man. That was a really wonderful thing that he did. It sure was. And it created, well, no, it, it created a lot of interesting discussion then, but the new mood is such that he might as well not have written the book, which yeah. is a shame because it was a tour de force at the time. Yeah. And then I guess it's, he and I did a blogging heads conversation once a very long time ago. There was no chemistry, frankly, we didn't, we didn't do it again. But I remember one thing he said, which was that affirmative action is the, the keystone point that what determines whether you were considered a black conservative or not is uh, whether you do what, how you feel about affirmative action. I imagine with the new format you're doing with the Glenn show, somebody can find a clip. You'll find a clip in there of me looking about 14 and Randall <laughs> saying that that is the, the main thing. And um, so maybe that's the way he feels, in which case there would be a part of him that would need to write that piece in, in that way. But it is definitely something different from what I have seen of him on roughly any other subject. And his contempt for Thomas, it's peculiar to read because suddenly he's red hot, but he defends it with detailed argumentation. Whereas with this one, it seems like it's a, a different a different person. I hope he speaks to me again, but yeah. Uh, I don't think Randy holds a grudge. He will probably demand equal time. And, and in, in other words, Randall Kennedy, if you're out there, if you can hear this voice, we want to talk to you at the Glenn Show, bro. So, you know, let's let's hook that up. All mm -hmm. right, John, I think it's a wrap over here. All right. Very so, good. We'll see you. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Soon. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Have a good gonna, one, Glenn. <laughs>